This morning I want to uh, introduce the, um, the meditation method that we're doing. There's different approaches, many different approaches to meditation and what we're doing in this retreat is just one of them. Broadly speaking, when the Buddha talked about meditation, he talked about it in terms of cultivating serenity and insight, samatha and vipassana. And both of these are necessary. Serenity is the, the calming, unifying, receptive aspect of the mind. And insight is what we recognize as what's happening when the mind becomes calmed and receptive. So any kind of meditation method has both of these aspects. But different methods will emphasize one over the other. Some will emphasize serenity over insight, others will emphasize insight over serenity. So you've, there's a whole number of meditation techniques that are available and they have different flavors depending, largely depending on what aspect they emphasize. This approach emphasizes insight and it was developed by a Burmese monk, Mahasi Sayadaw, in, um, in Burma. He was coming out of the, the uh, 19th and 20th century revival of Buddhism and Buddhist practice that you found throughout Southeast Asia in particular, but other parts of Asia as well. Now, this particular approach, well, first of all, if we, if we get down to basics and ask, well, what do we mean by meditation? We could say that meditation is the systematic training of attention. Attention is the deliberate placing of awareness on its object, and awareness is the knowing of the object. So if we go work backwards, awareness is the knowing of the object. So awareness is simply knowing that something is happening or knowing that something is present, and it's very basic. So for example, visual awareness. Right now, I know that you are present because I can see you. But awareness has depth and therefore, and so I can be faintly aware or very deeply aware or something in between. So at the moment, I know that you're here, but you exist as rather blurry blobs until I put on the glasses whereupon suddenly you have definition and you're quite clear. And I take them off again and you're still here but you've changed. Put them on again and you've returned. So awareness has depth and shallowness and if it has depth it can be developed. I can become increasingly aware, I can train awareness. So awareness is the knowing of the object, of the experience. Attention is the deliberate placing of awareness on a subject. So attention is about being deliberately aware. So right now I'm seeing and I'm not making any particular effort to see, it's just happening. But if I was wondering if a certain person turned up to do this retreat, then I'd have to start looking and I'd have to start scanning the room. Is she here? So this is the difference between seeing and looking. Looking implies something deliberate. And as soon as you talk about doing something deliberately, you bring in method. How am I going to look? Am I going to scan the room from left to right? or from right to left, from front to back, or back to front, or am I going to just look at random? I suddenly am I'm faced with choices about what do I do and how do I do it. And this is inherent in the whole aspect of doing something deliberately. So uh, if I'm going to cultivate awareness, I need to first of all work on attention. Attention is being deliberately aware and if I'm going to develop attention, I need some kind of method. So 
some way of going about doing it. So meditation is the systematic training of attention. This particular approach uh, is characterised by the division between primary object and secondary object. Any kind of meditation approach gives you something to be aware of, something to be attentive to. So probably the most common meditation object would be the breathing. So be, sit there and be aware of the breathing. So whatever the object is, there's always some kind of meditation object. There it is. Be aware of this. Pay attention to this. And we take something to be aware of and work with it uh, systematically over a period of time so that we really get to know that particular meditation object. And in the process, we cultivate, we make the quality of attention stronger and stronger and the awareness becomes stronger and stronger and deeper and deeper. So we call this the primary object. Now, the function of the primary object is to sustain attention over time. If we're going to have a meditation object, we need something that is available uh, always and that does something that we can, we can track, that we can follow. So this is why breathing is so popular. We're always breathing, so it's always available, and it's always doing something. There's something going on all of the time. So it's good for, uh, for tracking and for sustaining attention over a period of time. So the primary object is what sustains attention over time. If we start doing this process, at some point we discover what we call distraction. At some point we realise we're not doing it anymore because the mind's gone somewhere else. Is everyone here familiar with distraction? Oh, good. It's a common experience. In fact, it's universal. And yet, we tend to think of it as the enemy. Uh, often you get people thinking, oh, or saying, oh, I can't meditate because I get so many distractions. And if you think about it, you think, well, wait a minute, everybody gets distractions. So what's the deal? What's going on? What distinguishes Mahasi Sayadaw's approach is that he turns the distraction into a meditation object and he calls it the secondary object. The primary object is what sustains attention over time. It's what we keep, it's what we start with, it's what we keep coming back to. The secondary object is what grabs the attention from time to time. Another way of looking at it is that we choose the primary object. The secondary object is what chooses us. So we don't choose our distractions, they choose us. We're meditating away and then suddenly we realise my awareness is not on the meditation object, it's somewhere else. At that point we're faced with a choice. I could treat that something else as the enemy. I could see it as a signal of my failure as a meditator. I've stuffed it, I can't do this. I better go back and resume the meditation. Or I could recognise right now this is what I'm aware of. So right now this is my meditation object. And it's this approach that distinguishes this particular method. It's based on the, on the fact that, this, and the very simple fact that we can only be aware of what's happening now. I mean it sounds obvious when you say it. We cannot be aware of what did happen in the past, and we cannot be aware of what will happen in the future. It sounds obvious, but we ignore this simple fact again and again and again. So I suddenly realise that I'm in the middle of a distraction. And then what do I do? I immediately reject this experience. This, is, this experience is no good, it's a distraction. It's terrible. I've got to get back to the past when it was working okay but wait a minute, I can't be aware of the past. I can only be aware of the present. And what's happening right now is the distraction, which means the only thing I can be aware of right now is the distraction. So if I'm to be aware, I must be aware of this, which is happening now. 
So we incorporate distraction into the meditation practice uh, and we call it the secondary object. And when we realise we're distracted, we, t- we deliberately turn the awareness to that experience and note it. Now, n- in this approach to meditation, you often hear the, word, the, the verb to note. We're constantly noting the object, noting the meditation object. To note has a certain ambiguity. It means, first of all, to be deliberately aware of, to pay attention to. So to note a distraction means to be deliberately aware of the distraction. Secondly, it also means to name the experience. Here we use a naming technique to help with the attention. We name what we're attending to. So if it's the breathing, uh, Mahasi Sayadaw recommends recommends the breathing sensed in the body inside the body, particularly the lower body, in the abdominal area. And he says, uh, as we breathe in, there's movement and it's like the abdomen arises. And as we breathe out, it's like the abdomen falls. So there's a rising and a falling. People often get caught up with the specifics of the anatomy when they hear about this. And it's not about anatomy. Sometimes people say, but it's not the abdomen, it's the diaphragm. Or it's not rising, it's kind of moving some other way. All of this is completely irrelevant. It's really movement sensed inside the body. And we call the movement associated with the inhalation rising, the movement associated with the exhalation falling. What you call it is really irrelevant. But if we're going to talk about it, we we have to call it something. So we call it rising, falling. So as you breathe in, you feel that movement and you name it, rising. As you breathe out, you feel the movement and you name it, falling, rising, falling, rising, falling. Now, the attention goes not to the name, but to what's being named. The name is about aim. It's like a finger pointing to it. Right now I'm looking at this, and now I'm looking at that. And now this is happening, and now it's that. Now it's this, now it's that over there. So the name directs awareness to what's actually happening. Don't get stuck on the name itself. Um, So I'm meditating away, rising, falling, rising, falling, and then suddenly I realise that I'm distracted. Now the two most common forms of distraction would be physical pain and thinking. But there are others, of course. Whatever it is, I put my awareness on it and name it. So let's say if it's, if it's the body, physical pain, that's relatively straightforward. You know, it hurts somewhere. So I put my awareness to it and I make that pain the meditation object. And I name it. And I name it as accurately and as objectively as I can. I could, if I wanted to make it simple, just say, to myself, ah, pain. And that works. Except that the word pain has a negative connotation in the mind. You want ideally something which is more neutral, but also something which is more accurate. What is it exactly? So is it hardness? Is it pressure? Is it sharpness? Is it heat? Is it numbness? And so on. So recognise what it is and then name it and that's the meditation object and put the awareness there and then come back to the primary object. So acknowledge what is going on, acknowledge the distraction and then return to the primary object. If it's thinking, it's the same principle. With thinking, don't be concerned about what you're thinking about. Usually we get completely caught up in the story, in the narrative. Here we're stepping out of the narrative and just acknowledging the fact of thought and the feel of it. What does it feel like to be sitting here caught up in thought? And name that. Often we feel the thought going on up in in, in the head area. So put the awareness up there and acknowledge it, thinking. 
or distracted or lost it or whatever, whatever name fits. Acknowledge it deliberately and then come back to the primary object. So instead of just staying with what, trying to stay with one thing all of the time and failing, it's stay with the primary object, then go out, check this, note that, come back, go out, come back, go out, come back, go out, come back, go out, come back. So the primary object is the central reference point, and the secondary objects start to define a broader field of what's really going on. When you start to incorporate distraction, of course, it becomes important to recognise, well, what do we mean by distraction? For example, I could be distracted by sound. Now, right now, I'm sitting here and I can hear sounds. I can hear the birds. I can hear some kind of faint mechanical something in the background. Or is it the highway? Must be, yeah, it's the road. So, I've got birds and I've got road sounds. Let's say I'm meditating away on the breathing and I can hear birds or I can hear road sound. Is that distraction? Well, not necessarily. If I'm paying attention to something, attention always has the structure of centre and periphery. Let's say I'm, I'm, I'm looking at something. Above the doorway there, there's a picture of the Pope. If I look at that picture, that picture is now at the centre of my visual awareness. But I can see other things around the picture. I can see the wall underneath the Pope. I, at the, at the end, I can see the corridor and the, and the big, bigger picture at the end of the corridor. I can see the, the, the roof. I can see the floor. I can see this carpet here. I can see the people around. So there's centre and there's periphery, the field. If, if my attention gets drawn somewhere else, ah, so I can see a, the person at the centre of my field, but I can also see the room, the floor, and I can sense there's the Pope up there in the right. Shift the, the awareness. So wherever the attention goes, there's centre, what I'm focused on, and there's all the stuff happening around. So I can be with the breathing, that's at the centre, but on the periphery, there's physical sensation, maybe some thought going on in the background, the sounds further out. That's not distraction. That's periphery. And as you meditate, you can find yourself becoming more and more sensitive to what's going on in the periphery. One very common phenomenon, we don't, I don't think we get to do it here, is the meditation hall clock. We, we start a retreat and you notice there's a clock in the hall but it's mercifully silent. But after a day or two, suddenly it starts to tick. And a day or two after that, it's ticking incredibly loudly. And of course, it's making the same sound all the time. But we're becoming more sensitive, so it seems louder. So you can find that the, the environment starts to press in. And the things that you didn't notice before, you start to really notice, and they can really bug you. This is in developing sensitivity as the mind becomes stronger through the meditation. It becomes stronger and more sensitive, so you start to notice more. Now, the fact, if I'm with the breathing, the fact that I can hear sound, and even if that sound is, is bugging me, that's not necessarily distraction. Distraction is when I've left the, the breathing and I'm now obsessing over the sound. So it's that, that, at that point, the centre of my awareness is with the sound and my reaction to the sound. Distraction is when the centre of awareness is taken from one thing to another. The fact that I'm also thinking in the background is not distraction. Distraction is when I realise I'm completely caught up in thought and the breath has either disappeared or it's very faint in the background. That's distraction. And at that point, I acknowledge, ah, that's my meditation object now, because mm -hmm. this is where the centre of my awareness is. It's in the thinking, it's not in the breath. And that's when I note thinking, or note, if it's sound, hearing. Again, if you're hearing, it doesn't matter what you hear, just hearing itself. There's a, 
Zen expression, which someone I heard fairly recently, hear the bark, not the dog. And it sum, sums it up. It's just the sound. Don't be bothered about what it's sound of. It's just the sound. Uh, if it's sight, it's just seeing. Don't worry about what you're seeing. It's just seeing. And so on. Does that make sense? Anybody totally confused? When you say that at that point you say, well, aha, this is my meditation object now, but conceptually it was, isn't it? Yeah. At that point, well, that was my meditation object then. Note it and then back to the primary object. Hmm. So it's sort of a past thing that you've noted. It can be. Um, if with thought, for example, often you notice it, when you, when you deliberately notice it, it goes. So then if you then name it, you've named what just happened. Yeah. With thought, that's a very useful exercise because you're training yourself to go there. Even if you get there a bit late, still you're training yourself, okay, that's going on, now come back. Yeah. Other times it's, it sticks around. For example, if it's, so, if it's a sound or, or physical sensation, it stays. And then you are really looking at something in the present. And then what do you mean about making a decision? Because you say, this is my object now, the bird is the bird chirping. Mm-hmm. It's sound. Um, yeah, I often get caught up in noting that I want to stay here because it's pleasant, even though I know that I've noted that. Mm. So I kind of hang around that for a bit. It can get complicated. Why is it stuffing around there? Uh, I sort of feel a bit guilty because I've gone and you know, enjoyed the bird chirping or something. What about the painful sound? Do you stay with those as well? Um, no, well. In other words, do you find sound suitable as a meditation object? Painful. I usually do the sound thing. Yeah. Sound. If you find if you find that you have a sensitivity towards sound, stay there. There's no need to rush away. And when you're ready, come back. No. Not, not, not with like you're going out to have a little bit of a you know, play and then you, you've got to get back to the breath because that's what you're supposed to be doing. The breath, there's nothing particularly magical about the breath. Mm. So if you, can, if, you, if you find that sound works as a meditation object, stay with it. Mm. And when you've had enough, go back to the breath. Some people use sound as their primary object. The, the, sound, the, the, sec- the primary object is what sustains attention over time. There could be anything. Some people use thinking as their primary object. Not many, but some people do. Uh, some people use sound as their primary object. Some people use body sensation. Some people use breathing. You can use anything, so long as you can sustain attention over time with it. Anybody else? Yeah. I find that sound can be quite good if I'm, if I'm getting distracted to, um, from, by something else, usually thought, and then to, to hear something like a bird or whatever, and that seems to bring things back to the present and then easier to, to go back to the breath after that. Mm. I find that works really well. Yeah, that's a, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so again, use sound to stay with it. It's a... It's... It's sound has a great advantage as a meditation object. It's, for, it's always there. There's always some sound. Um, it, it too is always moving. <coughs> sound is never still. And um, one of the advantages, it has depth. It's like you can go out uh, and get into the, what the Buddha calls the space element with it. It's, it's, got, it's many, got many advantages to, as a meditation object. So certainly just stay there. As long as it's grabbing you, stay with it. Sorry? Is that the same way of dealing with emotions? Yeah, uh, emotion also. Uh, when emotion comes up, uh, an emotion is always complex. There's different things happening. For example, emotion is usually accompanied by thinking. Then there's also 
the emotional feel, the quality of, of the emotion itself, what it feels like. Now that's more stable and it's associated with the body. Often you notice that you carry your emotion in a particular part of the body, so it has location. So you can put your awareness there and just stay with it and then name it. Name the emotion. Not the thinking, not the story. If I'm angry, I'm angry with someone about something. That someone and something is just the story, is the thinking. But what I'd be focusing on is simply anger, irritation. What does it feel like? Where is it? What does it do? If I feel sorrowful, I'm usually sorrowful about something. That something is in the story, in the narrative. Forget it. Just focus on sorrow itself. What is it? What does it feel like? Where is it? And so on. So often, for example, I find that anger has a, has a sharp, energetic quality to it. Sorrow often has a softer, moister quality to it. And so on. So you start to use the emotion itself as the meditation object. Again, until it doesn't hold you anymore, and then come back to the primary object. So in the sitting, the breathing sensed in the body is the primary object, and we call it the rising, rising and falling. In the walking, it's the movement of the body, in particular the, of the, uh, the legs and the feet, and the contact, the touch, on the ground. So we're just going, I'll just go through the walking. Now for the walking, you need a walking track, real or imaginary, that you can walk up and down in. You start with standing, as we were doing this morning. So the feet shoulder length, length apart, outside of the feet parallel, and getting into that sense of balance. Now you can have the hands hanging by the side, hold them in front, hold them behind you, put them in pockets, whatever feels natural. Again, it's got a lot to do with the shoulders, getting the shoulders right. And then you step out and you start to walk, usually at a touch slower than normal. Walking meditation speed is a factor. How fast do you walk? You can do fast walking meditation. It can be very effective, especially if you're feeling tired or dull after meals or whatever. If you do fast walking, you have a longer track. You can do slow walking. That means you get a shorter track. The advantage of, slow, of the slow walking is that you can develop a very strong concentration with it. So what I emphasise here this morning is a slow walking, but you can do fast walking. So I recommend start a touch slower than normal, not because there's anything wrong with normal pace, but because we tend to be most mindless in our normal pace. You know, usually we don't pay attention as we walk. We're busy thinking something. We, we're busy going somewhere. The thing about walking meditation is we're not going anywhere. <laughs> So if you go a touch slower than normal, it makes it a bit more deliberate. Okay? You might start off like that. And your meditation object is movement and touch. Movement of the body as you're cruising along, particularly of the, the legs and the feet, and touch the impact of the foot on the ground. And you, just, and you can name it walking. Walking. You get to the end of your track, stopping, standing, turning, turning, standing, walking, and so on. Once you settle into it, you start to slow down and as you slow down, you become more focused on the, on the feet and the contact. And then you can start to divide the walk up into, say, left, right, left, right. As you become more settled into it, you can slow it down and make the awareness more precise. Start to divide each step into two. Lifting, placing, lift, place, lift, 
place. It can be more detailed and divided into three. Lifting, pushing, placing. Lift, push, place. You can divide it into four. Lift, push, place, touch as the weight shifts onto the foot. Lift, push, place, touch and so on. The slower you go, the more concentrated you become. It's very important not to try to go slow. Sometimes you see experienced meditators walking really slowly and you think, I have to catch up with them. I've got to walk at least as slowly as they are. And you get this perverse race where the prize goes to the slowest. <laughs> and it's, it's got nothing to do with it. You know, if you try to walk too slowly too soon, you just get really tight and agitated. If you notice that, start to speed up. Even go faster than normal. Get out into the garden, choo, up and down. Choo. Allow yourself to slow down. You will slow down as you become more focused. It's a natural process, so just allow it to happen. With the, the walking, a slow walking in particular, posture is very important. You don't want to be too tight with it. Sometimes you see people walking like this. You see what's wrong? Yeah, stiff as a board. Because I'm so focused down here that I'm cut off from the rest of the body. And there's a tension. There's a, a mental tension, but it comes out with the whole body. So when you walk, you walk with the whole body. Norm when we walk normally, there's, there, there's a swing. It's not, there's the whole body walking. It's the same thing with the slow walking. So, I'm standing, head right, step out with the left foot and then lean in with the left shoulder. Step out with the right foot and lean in with the right shoulder. So even though I'm walking very slowly, it's the whole body that's walking. And it's a much more comfortable thing to do. It's like the Theravada Buddhist equivalent of Tai Chi. So you just flow with the whole body. Walking meditation is not what we do to take a break between sits. It's a very important meditation practice. Whatever you do in the sitting, you can do in the walking in terms of concentration, insight, whatever. The the advantage of walking meditation is twofold. One is that the concentration you build up in walking lasts longer than that that you build up in sitting. So you can, take, you can bring that concentration with you into the sitting and it's like you turbocharge the sitting practice. Secondly, walking meditation is the halfway house. It's the hinge between the sitting on the one hand and the ordinary activities on the other. When we're not doing sitting meditation or walking meditation, then you're doing something, meals, jobs, room, bathroom, and so on. This is the third aspect of the meditation, where you stay with whatever you're doing, and you stay in particular in the body. Uh, normally we're lost in thought, and as soon as we get lost in thought, we're disconnected from the body. Drop the thinking, come back to the body. And the walking meditation is great training for that to get into that habit of just staying with the body as it moves. Any questions? Yeah. The, uh, the gaze is just, as in the sitting, is just naturally directed down. So it's not, uh, there's no particular length, it depends on height and so on and so forth. But it's just restfully dropped down. And then the eyes just glide along as you walk. So they're not grabbing at anything, they're just gliding along. In the walking, of course, you tend to get distracted by seeing and hearing much more than in the sitting. 
So when you do that, when that happens, note it. Oh, seeing. Come back. There's different ways of doing walking. In this particular approach, the movement of the walk itself is the meditation object. So breathing would be a secondary object. But some people find that they naturally tune into the breath as they walk. And some people find that they start to, that the steps start to come in, into tune with the breathing. If any of that happens, let it happen. It can, it can really help. But don't force anything. Just If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, forget about it. Uh, some people use the breathing, use breathing meditation in walking. They use breath as a primary object. That's another way of doing it. But here we're, we're more focused on movement and touch. But there's, there's always more than one way to do it. <laughs> Any other questions? In terms of the same place? Yeah. Yeah. Now find yourself a spot and settle in there. If someone has the audacity <laughs> to move in and grab your spot, um, you don't, it's not necessary to go up and hit them. <laughs> These things happen. Just <laughs> find another spot. <laughs> One time Syed or Ujanika was teaching in Canberra and he gave a talk on walking meditation and he explained the whole thing and then he said, any questions? And someone put up their hand and said, how do you do walking meditation again? <laughs> Which is, the, the meditation teacher's nightmare when people ask questions like that. But his response was really good. He, he, without hesitation, he said, you must walk to and fro, not here and there. <laughs> so, so walking meditation isn't having a nice wander around, <laughs> enjoying the view. It's true. Any other questions before we proceed? You need to have it all the time. Sorry? Do you need to have it everything you do all the time? Ah, no. The labelling is used the labelling is about aim. What can happen, particularly in the walking, is that you find yourself the awareness goes to the label and not to what, what's being labelled. If you notice that happens, and with the walking it's, it cannot be obvious, you know. Place. <laughs> when you've lifted the foot. <laughs> so if you notice that happening, drop the names. Just drop them and ignore them and just walk and just feel. In sitting and in walking, the naming is, is meant to cultivate aim. Some people use it a lot. Some people just use it a little bit. It's very much up to the individual. Sometimes you find the naming is useful especially when, for example, the experience has changed in some way. You notice that it's changed, but you're not, you can't quite put your finger on it. Then you name it. Ah, that's what it is. And then drop the name. So it's, you can use it in all sorts of ways. Don't get caught up with the names. The names help aim. If they get in the way, drop them. <laughs>